What's up, guys? A good evening to you, or a good morning to you, wherever you are in the world. I wanted to check in with you to share some insights that I've been getting really recently on a subject that I think probably all of us can relate to, which is the subject of willpower. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely have my fair share of challenges with willpower. And if you're like me, somewhere in your life, willpower and conserving your willpower, applying your willpower when you need it is a challenge area for you. And if that resonates, chime in here. Share where you're struggling with willpower right now or where you have struggled in the past and where you've managed to succeed. Because I've just had the pleasure of having a very dear family member stay with me over the past uh, weekend. And she has, uh, she's my aunt, and she's an amazing human being. And she's full of joy. She's a really positive person. And she's full of life. And she's 75. So she's a very positive human being. But she has one Achilles heel. Her willpower when it comes to certain types of food is just non-existent. It's so bad. It's so bad that she has a really difficult time. And if you're listening to this, I want you to think about where in your life willpower is causing your problem. Is it perhaps in your personal life and your personal fitness goals? Is it in your health goals? Is it in your food choices? Or is it perhaps not even in your food choices, but it's the way you speak to certain people. You just, you lose patience with certain people. Is that where your willpower is letting you down? Or is your willpower letting you down in your ability to make certain amounts of money or achieve certain heights in your career because your will is breaking? You, you see, I think for everyone, willpower has its role to play. And for a lot of us who are on a spiritual journey, willpower is a really big factor because it makes a massive difference as to whether we succeed in a spiritual discipline, sadhana, in spiritual practice. Because without willpower, you, you, you're crushed. And it's a real effort between combining our intellect, combining our emotional power, our EQ strength, which a friend of mine, she speaks about this a lot, and combining all these different skills in order to provide a powerful base upon which our willpower can build. And yet so many of us, we lose that willpower. It just goes out the window. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about this story. My aunt's come down from Sheffield, and um, she's been with us for a little while. And what we noticed about her is that she has this almost automatic tendency to reach to the fridge to find a sweet dish straight after a meal. It's like on cue. She finishes a size spicy dish, a curry, the main meal's done, and she has to reach in the fridge to go and grab something out. You know, it's gotta be a trifle or a chocolate or something. And if it's not that, then an hour or two later, she'll wanna go and she'll go and reach for the nasto. Those of you who are Indian, you'll know what I mean. But those of you who are not, Bombay, think Bombay mix, crisp snacks, nuts, chips, something kind of, something to take that kind of slight midnight munchy thing off. And time after time, this one habit kills her willpower and, help, and, and causes her to gain calories. And it's not been good for her at all. And so we see it all the time. Even in the afternoon, she's reaching for sweets. It's almost every single meal she has, she has to have a sweet. And it's a sweet tooth tendency. Now, putting aside the biological considerations that make a person have uh, difficulty in controlling themselves when it comes to certain types of food, and there are biological predispositions. People who are diabetic may have certain things. So putting aside biological considerations, why do people eat this kind of stuff? Why do we do this? We know it's not good for us to have so many sweets, and yet we do this. Um, and if you can hear me, by the way, just drop me a note here. Let me know that you can hear this. Uh, check in and drop a note to say that you can hear me nice and clear. It doesn't matter if you can't see me. Um, and if you can, you'll see all these wrinkles on my forehead. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time in the sun. And so that, that's what's going down there. Got a tan. Um, so willpower. Why do we do this? Why do we take stuff that's not good for us and we still go and have it? So here's the thing, folks we're not in command of our senses. We are not in full control of our senses. Most human beings are ruled by the senses. Most human beings are commanded by the senses. Most humans 
fail, fall prey to their senses. It's a tendency for humans to not have their senses under control. That is a path. There is a process to do that. There is a path. The yoga practices help us to do that. The ancient practices from India, other traditions help us to learn to control our senses by controlling the mind. You control the intellect. You control the mind. You control the mind. You control the senses. But sometimes the senses just take you and carry you off somewhere. The Bhagavad Gita talks about this, that the senses are always carrying us off somewhere, like horses on a chariot that are taking the charioteer in all directions because the horses are just uncontrolled. The reins are like the mind. The chariot driver is supposed to be our intellect our int or our intelligence. And the person sitting in the chariot is us, the passenger, the soul. So the soul is supposed to be guiding the charioteer, as in the intellect, the intelligence, what to do. The intelligence is supposed to control the reins, right? The charioteer holds the reins. The reins are the mind. And the mind controls the horses. The five horses are the five senses. And this analogy is beautifully given in the Bhagavad Gita. And yet here we are. Our horses are leading us astray week in, week out, day in, day out. And this is such a tragedy because we suffer at the hands of our senses. And how many of you can relate to this? Again, I'm just going to chime in and say, make sure you can hear me. If you can't hear me, just drop us a note. But otherwise, I'm going to assume, thank you, Hina. Welcome, guys. So glad you can hear it. And I want to put a big tribute out to all of our brothers and sisters following the Islamic faith who have been fasting. Now, that's the challenge for the will. They've been fasting for Ramadan, Ramadan for so long now. And they're just breaking their fast. It is the holy time of Eid. And therefore, the Idul Fatr festival is on where people are now breaking their fast and feasting. What a challenge it must be. And if you or any of you have been fasting for Ramadan, I'd love to hear how you've been managing to do that. It's a real challenge for our senses to do that. And one of the biggest realizations I've come to know, and I speak to some of my friends about this, is that willpower is limited. Our willpower is like a cell phone battery. It's, a, it's like a mobile phone battery. It's limited. People think that they have unlimited willpower and they can do anything they want. But we know the truth is not that, right? We know that our willpower is not unlimited. If any of you have succumbed to that bowl of ice cream, if any of you have fallen prey to that extra bar of chocolate, if any of you have fallen prey to the extra glass of vino, you know what I'm talking about. We all have this. So willpower is limited. We all cave in. And so what I want to share, my realization is that our willpower is like a mobile phone battery. It does deplete as it's used. Imagine using your phone all day and then you come home, the battery's like 12% and then you're gonna try and make a whole bunch of calls. The, the battery dies. It's like that with our willpower. Imagine you've been working hard all day, your willpower's been tested, you've been had a challenging day at work and then you come home and your willpower's at 12% and suddenly you're presented with nothing to eat in the fridge and you're tired so you just reach for a bowl of chips you go and order a takeout a high calorie piece of takeaway food you reach out grab some chocolates a bag of potato crisps and a can of coke suddenly you've just loaded yourself with way more calories than you should do because our willpower is depleted and i think this is the point that we got to get we got to realize that our willpower is limited it is like a cell phone battery and therefore what i would put is that we need to learn to control and conserve that willpower. I want to share a couple of ways how that's done. Um, and I really want to focus that. I want to do this in two parts. I want to talk about part one is triggers. What are the triggers that cause us to have these bad habits? What are the triggers that cause these bad habits to take effect? And therefore, if we can learn to identify the triggers that cause these bad habits to occur, then we have a better chance at exercising our willpower. And then as, as a second part, we'll look at how we can use that willpower and how we can use it in a way that it's conserved and we don't waste our willpower. So let's look at part one first. So for me, and I put to you, there are four things that we need to do when it comes to identifying the triggers that are causing us to apply or be prey, fall victim to our bad habits. They are the what, who, why, and when the what, who, why, and when of bad habits. Let's just go through these for a second. I want to deconstruct this for a second because I think it will make more sense. If you take any bad habit, whether it's, let's just pick any bad habit, right? Um, overeating, not going to the gym, or, ex or indulging in something that you know you probably shouldn't, um, including watching TV excessively, 
or sleeping more than you probably ought to. Let's deconstruct it and look at these four factors. So let's look at the what. There is always one of these four, there are always one of these four triggers at play. If we look at the what, there could be a what that triggers it. So for example, when you're finished with the meal, like I gave the example with my aunt, the what that triggers it is the meal, the event. Finishing the meal causes my aunt to want to reach for the fridge and go grab a chocolate or a sweet dish. For some people, it's lighting up a cigarette, right? They've just had a great meal. They want to light up a cigar or light up a cigarette, I'm not making anybody bad for having a cigarette. I'm just saying that there may be a habit that you want to give up. It might be the what for you is at, um, during the morning, right? Your what is that you know, you've know you just gotten on the train and you're on your way to work. And so for you, your what is I get on the train and that event of getting on the train to commute into London is I'll go and look at my social media or I'll go play games on my phone. That's the what. So a bad habit or a habit that you want to overcome may be triggered by a what. Now let's look at the why. A why could be a certain emotional state that causes that trigger to be pulled. So for example, nail biting. I used to bite my nails a lot. And I noticed that my nail biting occurs a lot when I'm in this state of anxiety. When I'm anxious, when I'm nervous, when I'm stressed out, I noticed that I would kind of reach my mouth and I'd go for my nails. For you, it might be something, maybe for you, it might be shopping. You know, you might get stressed out. You've had a really bad day. You've had a fight with your loved one. And so you, to stress, to de-stress, you go out drinking and you go knock back a few more than you should, or you go shopping because that's your way to counteract stress. Or you go gambling. I know I got a couple of people who I know who just to take out the stress from their family situation, they've had a big situation or a big snafu at home, they just go out and do gambling. They just go out to one of the gambling places or casinos and that's how they let off their steam. They lose a ton of money, they come back and they're poorer, right? That's your why. So second trigger is looking at the emotional state that you're in that's causing you to want to indulge in that particular bad habit. And that means becoming mindful. And this is a whole conversation in itself, right? Becoming mindful. But becoming mindful is a process and is part of that journey to make sure that you can catch when you're doing this. And so therefore, the strategy there is to be conscious of what kind of state you're getting yourself in. If you're having an argument with somebody, if you're having a conflict with somebody, notice how your which emotions are showing up for you. Notice what emotional state you're in and then pay attention to what habit, bad habit, is being triggered by that emotional state. So that's trigger number two. Let's look at the third and fourth triggers. Trigger number three, who? Some of these bad habits may be triggered by who, the company that you're with. For example, you might be out with your colleagues after work, right? And being out with your work colleagues after work is your trigger to go and indulge in, say, having a few drinks. And that might be fine for you, but then maybe you're having a few extra drinks because your colleagues are egging you on, right? There's this whole fun thing about being around your colleagues. One person buys a drink. you got to buy a round, of course, because you're such a nice guy or gal. And before you know it, you've gone two, three, four mile round, rounds excess of what you should have done. So who, what, the company that you keep, what is that causing you to indulge in that bad habit? It could be that when you're around people that want to go and engage in gambling and gambling is not good for you. Let's say you're trying to give up the habit of gambling. Let's say you're trying to give up the habit of smoking. I know a lot of people, some of my family members who would light up a cigarette back in the day just because of the company that they were in. And, you know, I used to see colleagues doing this at my offices all the time. They come down, they come smoke for it together. So it could be a who, the company that you keep or the environment, the people that you're around triggers that bad habit, right? Some people have it with spouses or in their relationships. When they're around a particular family member or a loved one and they get stressed, um, they just reach for a bad habit because that person is causing them stress. And so a why as in an emotional trigger and a who as in a company trigger, a person trigger, both triggers are being fired at the same time. So that's the third one to consider. And the fourth trigger is the when. When is a bad habit happening? And this is the other key thing. Could it be that you're reaching for that bowl of ice cream or the extra pack of crisps or chocolate after 10 o'clock at night? Could it be that because you're up late and you're doing whatever you're doing and it's getting late into the evening and you're kind of feeling that kind of late night munchies feeling and therefore you reach out for something? So it could be a when trigger. It could be a first thing in the morning. How many of you guys have coffee? How many of us do that? I know I used to have a coffee in the morning. It took me ages to wean myself off of a massive dose of caffeine, right? So that becomes your when. You wake up. 
you head into the office, you grab, you go for that Starbucks, you go grab that. So it's a when, it's the morning, your mind's now on autopilot. Oh, it's the morning, I've got to go to Starbucks, I got to get my massive overly calorie laden double chalk latte, right? And before you know it, you've taken in an extra 100, 200 calories and had a massive dose of caffeine, not realizing that your caffeine sensitivity is going right down the pan, so you need more of the stuff to get the same effect, right? You become desensitized. So look for that trigger, the when, the when trigger. Could it be when? So a quick summary of what we've talked about. Our willpower is limited. It's like a cell phone battery. It gets drained. And one of the key things to look at to deconstruct and to take control of that willpower is to look at the triggers that are causing that willpower to be depleted. And we've looked at four triggers, the what trigger, the why trigger, emotional state, the who trigger, the company that you keep, the people that are around you that are winding you up or tempting you to indulge in that bad habit, and the when trigger, the time of day or night that seems to be the cause of you indulging in that bad habit. So that's a little share for you. What I wanna do as a part two is I wanna look at how we can conserve that willpower and how we can actually transmute some of the bad habits that we've got into something that's a lot more healthier and that doesn't deplete our willpower. And I think that's gonna be super helpful for all of us because I know it's for me personally. I've been working on it with my aunt, so I'll share with you on the next session how we actually did this with my aunt and how I've got her to change her association with the certain types of food and change that habit into something that's there because there's a way to do it that is really not that healthy and will drain your willpower. And there's another way which is a lot healthier, but most people don't seem to do. And I want to explore that second way, the way that most people aren't doing it and how we can tap into that to harness our willpower, to conserve it and actually start making a genuine difference in how we control our senses, how we control our food, save calories, improve our health, and all the other good stuff that comes with it. So that's it from me here. I hope that's been of help. Share your comments, leave a little love and like, share this with your friends, and I will do the second half very, very soon. So watch out for that. We'll go live and we'll do part two. Take care. Peace out. Namaste.